I want to make a bet with all of you. When you leave tonight, you're going to have one piece of information that you'll never forget, you'll always remember, and hope you never use. See, betting is my business. I work for a company in Dallas called SCA Promotions, and we provide prize coverage for things like hole and run at golf tournaments, half court shots at basketball games, field goal kicks. Think of us as like, uh, let's make a deal on steroids. So for the next few minutes, I want you to see the world through the eyes of a gambler, a risk taker. So follow along and see what you would do if you were in my shoes. The first little exercise is a puck. If it goes through this hole, I pay them people $5,000. So my job is to make certain that everything is fair. So before the event happened, they said, well, we want to put a hole over here and a hole over here for 100 bucks. Now, you only pay if it goes through the center hole. And I said, that's fine. Well, they had the promotion. The puck went through the hole for $100, and I paid $5,000. You say, well, how is that possible? Well, when the hole went through the $100 hole, it bounced off the back and ricocheted through the center. And I didn't say which way it had to go. So that was the first $5,000 lesson that I learned early on. So now, let's go up to the junior high school level. They approached me with a golf ball. They said, we want to see if they hit it 600 yards you pay 50000 Well, 600 yards with the golf ball is a long way. They said, Norman, what do you think? And I thought about it, and I said, it's a good idea. We should do it. We'll make some money. Monday morning came, and I wrote a check for 50000 The reason was pretty simple. What they didn't tell me was point A to point B. Point A was on a five-story building. Point B was down here. They had a 40-mile-an-hour tailwind on asphalt downhill. <laughs> I don't know how I kept my job, but they didn't fire me. That was early on. So you say, well, how does a guy get a job like this? It's kind of strange. Well, when I was 14, I went to work at a roadhouse in Oklahoma as a bartender. I was tending bar at 14. I had a rather unusual upbringing. Uh, I wasn't worried, though, about getting arrested because our best customer was the sheriff of Rogers County. <laughs> now, the sheriff drank CC and 7, and I learned from the owner of the bar, of the roadhouse, he got two shots of whiskey where everybody else got one. It was my first lesson in customer service. So from there, I became a policeman, and then I became an insurance adjuster, and I got interested in magic and bridge and met some real interesting people along the way and developed three job skills. I learned how to open doors when they aren't there. I learned how to dig in the dirt, and I learned how to see the world kind of on the slant. And that's helped me because we've done promotions for as little as 42 cents and as much as a billion, and I've liked all of them but one. We did one promotion I didn't like very well, and that's what I'm really here to talk to you about. It's the, the promotion I could call, what did you say? Promotion. And it was sparked by my girlfriend, because I became deaf in my right ear, and I would sit at home at night, and she'd say something. I'd say, what'd you say? And she said, I said, I said, what'd you say? And so anyway, she kept saying, go to the doctor, go to the doctor, and I kept ignoring her. I'm sure none of you out there have ever done that with your wife or girlfriend, but I did. So one day I came home, and she handed me a business card. I said, what's this? She said, it's to go see the audiologist. Now, I'm from the country. I prefer to say I had to go get my hearing checked. But so I went, and uh, I got my hearing checked. And when I filled out the form, they said, reason for visit, I said, my girlfriend made me. <laughs> so after I went to the doctor, he had me do some tests, and the next day the doctor called me. Not the nurse, but the doctor, and he summoned me to go to another doctor's office. Now, when I was in high school, I got summoned to the principal's office all the time, and that's bad. 
But when you get summoned to go to the doctor's office and you're a grown-up, that's worse. So I went to the doctor's office. I was a doctor that was a guy named Dr. Peters, and a uh, nice fella. And when I sat down, he said, Norman, I know what your problem is. He said, you have an acoustic neuroma. Do you know what that is? I said, yeah, I know what acoustic is. It's what you used to play pool with. He said, no, you have a, you have a brain tumor. And I didn't know what to say. He said, you have a very large brain tumor. He said, your brain is roughly the size of a cantaloupe. He said, your brain tumor is the size of a baseball. For the first time in my life, I really wanted to be average. Uh, I said, he said, now, that's the bad news. He said, the good news is, he said, it's real slow growing, and if you leave it alone, all it's going to do is kill you. I said, time out. I said, I don't like door number one. I'll take door number two or door number three. He said, there is no door number three. He said, there's just door number two. He said, you only have one option. He said, you either keep the brain tumor, it'll kill you, or you have surgery and we'll get rid of it. And I said, uh, okay. And I left. I left that day. And I went home. And I couldn't tell my girlfriend. I could not say the words. I have a brain tumor. I can say it now because I've said it a lot. It's been three years, but I couldn't say it at the time. I had to be like a 14-year-old boy, and I had to write it out and hand her a note, like, will you go out on a date with me? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say it. So after I gave her the note, I didn't have a pity party or any of that stuff. So the next day, I did what I've learned and what I've done for the last 21 years at STA. I started opening doors where there weren't any. I started digging in dirt. The first door I opened was I called the number one malpractice attorney in the city of Dallas. I made an appointment to go see him. Now, I haven't been to see the surgeon yet. I just wanted to go see the malpractice attorney first. <laughs> I'm not dyslexic. So I sat down to see the attorney, and when I did, he said, have you been injured? I said, I haven't. He said, what drugs have you taken that caused the problem? I said, none. He said, you were in a car wreck. I said, no. He said, you don't understand. He said, Mr. Beck, I sue people for a living. And he said, until you've had one of those, we're going to have a hard time winning this lawsuit. <laughs> I said, no, sir. And he was thinking what you all are thinking right now. What is this crazy Okie doing seeing a malpractice attorney before you go get surgery? I said, sir, let me explain it to you. I said, I'm not in here because I want to sue anybody. I said, I want to know if this Dr. Peters and this Dr. Lazar that he said were going to be working on me for 12 hours, if they're the kind of people that I'd want digging around in my head. He said, in 35 years of being a malpractice attorney, I've never had anyone ever come to me and said they wanted to hire me for something like this. I said, well, up until yesterday, I didn't need you. I said, think about it. I said, 50% of the doctors out there graduate in the bottom half of their class. <laughs> he said, you know, I never thought of that. I said, that's why I insure game shows for a living, and that's why you do whatever it is you do. <laughs> but I'll tell you now, I didn't stop there. I went. And I talked to three patients that these guys had operated on, and I interviewed them, said, what kind of doctors are they? I got to be really good friends with, with the two nurses that they had working for them, Jan and Verena. I got to be really good friends with them because I wanted to find out what I could. I went up at 2 o'clock in the morning to the hospital, that ICU unit where they said I'd be staying for a week, and I found a nurse at 2 o'clock in the morning had kind of a warm heart. And I said... Tell me about this Dr. Lazar fellow. What kind of a person is he? And she said, well, he's rough. He's tough. He's got a really shitty bedside manner. And he's the best neurosurgeon in the city. I said, we'll get along just fine. <laughs> and then after I did that, 
I went and I found a doctor that would sit with my mom and my girlfriend during the surgery so he could be like a liaison. And then I went and I got my shoes shined. See, right outside Dr. Peter's office is Al. Al has the shoe shine sign. He shines shoes every day. And he's the guy I wanted to talk to because he sees things and you don't even know he's looking. I sat down and he was shining my shoes. And in fact, he shined these that I'm wearing tonight, as a matter of fact. And I said, Al, what kind of doctor is this Dr. Peters? He was popping a rag and we got to be pretty good friends. And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, well, Norman, he cares. And that gave me a lot of comfort because the tumor didn't care. The tumor was just there. It didn't care how young or how old or how good or how bad or how, how scared I was. And I was scared. But that made me feel good. So on August the 28th, 2013, I did what every good gambler does. I got ready to pay off my bet. I went home. After I got my hair cut, I had Lisa cut my hair beforehand because, you know, I didn't know how long I was going to be before I could do it again. So I went home and I wrote letters of goodbye to the people that I love in case things didn't work. I took my suit out of the closet and I laid it on a chair in my apartment in case I didn't get to come back for it. Because, you know, in the best situations, you don't always win. I had my odds at 50-50. Now, the doctor said it was better than that. But I had it at 50-50. Either I'd win or I'd lose. And I sincerely hope that you all never find yourself in that situation that I was in. But if you do, and you are, I hope you'll go out and find the doors and open them and dig in the dirt and talk to that nurse on the floor at 2 o'clock in the morning or go talk to the malpractice attorney who thinks you're crazy until you explain the facts of life to him. And then I hope you go get your shoes shined and listen to what Al has to say. And when they say he cares, it'll matter. You know, three times during my surgery, my heart stopped, and three times... They started it again. You get in a situation like that, you don't want somebody who it's their first day on the job or graduated the last in their class. You know, the saddest day of my life, the saddest day was putting that suit on the chair. The happiest was when I got to pick it back up. And my wish for you folks tonight is that when you leave, if you ever find yourself in my spot and you have to make a bet like I do and you win, when you go home and you pick that suit up, I hope you smile. Thank you.